The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Strategizer uh, Strat Chat webinar session. We'll be starting the broadcast momentarily. In the meantime, why don't you take a moment to just think about what you hope to learn from today's session, and you can share it in the questions box um, or in the chat box. And if you're on Twitter, uh, follow us at Strategizer and tweet at us with the hashtag, hashtag StratChat. We'll be starting in, in a couple of minutes. Hi, everyone. For those of you who are just joining us, um, we'll be starting the session momentarily. In the meantime, uh, we just ask you a question. What do you hope to learn from today's session? You can share it in the chat box. You can share it in the questions box of the GoToWebinar panel. Um, or if you're on Twitter, follow us at Strategizer and tweet us with the hashtag, hashtag StratChat. We'll be starting in a, in a minute. All right, let's get started. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning for those of you in North America. Good afternoon for those of you in Europe. Uh, good evening to anybody in Asia and the Pacific region. And a very late night for those of you on the East Coast of Australia, if you're joining. Today's Strat Chat webinar session is about business model design for 21st century companies. I'm your moderator, Kavya Gupta. I manage content and community at Strategizer. You probably noticed me from emails, on social media, as well as on the blog. Our host today is a good friend uh, of Strategizer, Gregory Bernarda. He's also the co-author of Value Proposition Design, along with Alexander Osterwalder and Eve Pinier. Uh, if you're in Australia or if you're in the Asia-Pacific Asia region, region next October, Greg will be uh, hosting a two-day Strategizer Masterclass in Melbourne, Australia. It's our first in Australia, um, and it's going to be a hands-on learning experience that goes through not only the business model generation um, methodology and tool set, but also value proposition de design. Throughout this webinar, if you have any thoughts, comments, or feedback, feel free to tweet us at Strategizer, and again, use the hashtag, hashtag StratChat. You can also visit blog.strategizer.com to get more resources and content around topics like today's, um, as well as others in our library. I also want to take a quick moment to talk about our two online courses, Mastering Business Models and Mastering Value Propositions. Um, we sell them together as a master's bundle, and those of you who are attending the webinar today get an exclusive discount to these two courses. Greg will be focusing on business model design for 21st century companies, but a lot of what he might be talking about today goes along with our courses as well. To give you a, a quick idea of what you get, you're obviously going to get the proven methodology introduced in our global best-selling book, Business Model Generation and Value Proposition Design. You get over 70 bite-sized learning, learning pieces across 13 lessons on six crucial topics, and you get unlimited access to 50 videos and over eight hours of learning content that doesn't expire. Of course, what's most important is the certificate of completion, and that's what's going to differ differentiate yourself and stand out as a top performer. 
You can share your accomplishments with our downloadable and verifiable certificates uh, when you complete the course. So the exclusive offer for live attendees today, I'll be sharing the, the link and the, the coupon code in the chat box throughout the session. If you purchase the master's bundle, both courses, in 48 hours, we'll give you 15% off. All you have to do is use the code September, uh, September Webinar 2017. You can visit strategizer.com slash training slash courses. Again, I'll pass that link uh, in the chat box and you'll have 48 hours to uh, take advantage of that offer. If you're not satisfied with the courses, we'll simply give you your money back with a 60-day guarantee. That's it. No questions asked. Um, Greg will probably mention a couple uh, of resources and tools. Um, for those of you that have an account or you don't, you can create a free account at strategizer.com and you'll get access to our resource library. Now, the tools and resources uh, that are mentioned in our blog posts, webinars, books, and services are all available for free. You get access to 30-plus templates, uh, guides, all kinds of great stuff in there. Lastly, if you're a large organization looking to bring in uh, training and solutions, you can look at our enterprise offering. We've got many solutions to help global companies upskill teams, validate new ideas, expand existing business lines, or launch new growth engines. You can visit strategizer.com slash enterprise for more detail there, or you can get in touch directly with our super fast sales team with sales at strategizer.com. Greg, I'm going to pass the reins over to you and let you get started. Uh, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thanks, Gabby. Hi, everyone. Really glad to be here. So I'm going to start my slides. Gabby, you can tell me if you can see them. Yep, you're good to go. All right. So about this topic of uh, business model design for 21st century companies, and, and I'm going to get into a bit more of what that means. I um, also want to share three stories today and uh, along with three strategies that hopefully you can take home and apply on your own uh, particular problem, sector, industry. But first I want to share uh, kind of a aha uh, uh, moment that I had uh, on this topic. So I, I do a lot of work on innovation and strategy with organizations of all kinds. Um, and a few years back I, I find myself in China and uh, working with a group called the China Development Research Foundation, it's a think tank that advises the Chinese premier. And so we're sitting at the top of this uh, hotel in the middle of Beijing, and they have gathered a group of, uh, of international guests to talk about you know, the future of China, economic and social development models. And so in many ways, I find myself in a lot of these types of discussions, and you know, it feels pretty similar. But there's one thing that's very different this time, and it's the view from the hotel. All I can see that day is this. And this has a big impression on me. You know, you look out the window and I, I can't see the bottom of the street. It's like a scene in Mad Max, a bit after the apocalypse. And so all of a sudden, the same discussions I'm having in other parts of the world, they've become really real. So for China, a uh, few years back and still now, it's getting a little better now, but still now pollution is a, is a big problem. It's also a very messy problem because you know, economic growth is really what created this uh, pollution problem, it's literally killing people. And yet economic growth is also what has lifted hundreds of millions uh, of Chinese out of poverty. So I start wondering, you know, can, can we imagine a different kind of growth or a different kind of progress? And so I leave the workshop. I'm on my way out of China and I have a stopover in Hong Kong. And I have, uh, I have some time until my next flight. So I go to the bookstore. Uh, in the entrance of the bookstore, I see this. You may recognize this. You know, there's an actual display with the best-selling books of the bookstore. And right at the top of the list is this book, Business Model Generation, which you all know. And so I have to put this in context for you, because Alex Osterwalde and I are good friends. We were classmates at the University of Lausanne. And so at the time, he had told me, you know, I'm working on this thing, business model, we might put together a book. But, you know, it's still very early. And of course, you never really expect your classmate buddy to come up with a bestseller just like that. And so 
there it is. And, you know, I send it, I take a picture, I send it to Alex. But I'm really intrigued because in China, you know, we're talking about new social economic business models. And here I find this book that basically, you know, has this approach that makes it extremely easy to think systematically about a business model and also to think with agility, which are, I think, two things, you know, systemic, systematic, systemic thinking and agility, you know, is what I think is, um, you know, is the kind of thing that we that we need today to uh, tackle these these very messy and complex problems. So, you know, I have kind of a hope at this point, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, can business models save us a little bit? And, and my answer is that I think, yes, I think it's going to help. I think it's already helping. And so I want to put this, uh, uh, you know, very quickly in context of, you know, the kind of envir environment that we're in. And you might have heard this before in a way or another. It's a bit of a caricature, but, you know, essentially, if you look at the 20th century, most organizations, they were operating in a simple context, right? And the, the main currency for success was uh, exploitation. Now, in the 21st century, the context has become a lot more complex, right? It's very messy. There's a lot of uncertainty. And yet, the currency for success is innovation. So we need to start understanding how we can navigate this very messy complex so that we can find ways to, uh, to create new values to solve the kind of problems that I've seen in China or, or some other ones. And so I think one problem that we have today is that organizations are still formatted for the 20th century, not so much for the 21st century. So that's what I want to talk a bit about. And of course, the uh, pollution problem in Beijing is just one example. It was my aha moment. But you might have had another one. You know, there are many problems out there, many opportunities to, uh, to kind of uh, have aha moments. You know, you can think of obesity, the state of the media, uh, poverty, and so on and so forth. And so there is uh, this group, uh, Havas, uh, Havas Media, Havas Group, uh, came up with a study a few years back. They still run it every year. Uh, and they found out that, you know, people wouldn't care if 74% of all the brands in the world just disappeared from one day to another. They would, it wouldn't make a difference to their life because basically it doesn't add to their quality of life, doesn't improve their life. So I think the organizations that want to play in this 21st century, they, start, they need to start uh, embracing a new mindset, a new toolbox, uh, a new way of doing things. So I, that's where I, I think for me, in my own experience, um, that the uh, business model toolbox is so, is so helpful. So I want to give you a quick reminder before I get into the stories. Uh, some of you have, might have seen this, uh, this chart before. This is to um, kind of put in context what a good business model design is. And you see four different levels here of strategies. Uh, the first level, level zero, is when you have a great product market fit or a great value proposition, um, but you, you're not yet thinking about a business model, right? So it's, you, you need to have that, but it's not sufficient. Level one strategies is when you start thinking about your business model, maybe you pull out a uh, business model canvas, but you, know, you just start to put st things into the nine boxes. You don't go much beyond that so you're kind of looking at you're going to taking the business model canvas is just a checklist and then the next level level two strategy is when it starts becoming interesting that's where you want to be it's when you start to have a business model as a story so you start to pay attention to the relationships between the different blocks and becomes a becomes coherent it hangs together as a system i think those are the most powerful business models and you think of Companies, you know, like Nespresso, we've talked a lot about Nespresso here, Apple, low-cost airlines, and so on and so forth. They have a great business model uh, as a story. And then level three is when you can, you know, start, you can, you basically have developed the capability to do that over uh, uh, and over again. You, uh, you reinvent yourself at the level of, of business models. 
So one of the reasons that I like the, the model uh, and just the BMG and VPD language so much is that it makes it easy to decode the best business model strategies out there. And so because of that, right now it also makes it much easier to, you know, to stretch ourselves and deal with the kind of messy problems that I was talking about. And so to decode the strategies that make great businesses at the same time as advancing us um, as a society. So those are the ones that we've become intrigued about um, uh, and that I want to share. You know, these are the stories that, uh, you know, deal with 21st century type of context. They solve problems like pollution, poverty, fulfill maybe a latent aspiration in customers. Uh, maybe they introduce a societal transformation too. They're basically creating a path for us into the future. Uh, there's a good quote that I like to all, that, that also describes this, these types of stories. It's a quote from Pixar, uh, the animation studio. Uh, it's a quote on leadership. That's what they say. Leadership is creating a world people want to belong to. And I think this is a great way of describing what these, uh, these stories are about. And remember, they are doing that at the same time as becoming breakthrough businesses, extremely successful uh, businesses. I think both of these things um, can be done together uh, and in fact they, they very much go together um, in some ways. So I want to share these three stories today as uh, stories of you know this what we call 21st century business models. Now none of them are perfect and I think it would be a mistake to try and look for the perfect stories that are doing everything well. Uh, but they each hold a particular recipe, a strategy, a key uh, that we can basically learn from and ultimately the, the we can then take home and, uh, and apply on our own context. Um, I think also when you start talking about those kinds of, uh, of, of business model designs, you have to take the context into, uh, into account. So I'm going to give you a bit of a variety of contexts. We're going to go to China first. Um, then we're going to go to Europe, look at a B2B company. A lot of people are curious about B2B business models. Uh, and then we'll finish in the US uh, to talk about uh, how a, a popular company is thinking about the future. So my first story is this. Uh, so mentioned it's in China. And I think this kind of uh, thing, you know, how to create 18 million jobs in 10 years can probably only happen in China, maybe India as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, the strategy that I want to kind of put into light is the whole idea of how you build a new ecosystem or you reorganize an, an ecosystem. And the company I want to talk about is the company of this guy. You may recognize him. He's becoming more and more popular these days. Uh, Jack Ma. Uh, Jack Ma is the founder of the Alibaba Group. And a little bit less well-known is this company called Taobao. And Taobao is an e-commerce uh, marketplace. It's only in China, only in the Chinese language, uh, but it's actually the biggest part of the business of Alibaba. And so it's a huge company, probably the biggest e-commerce marketplace on earth, uh, bigger than Amazon and eBay. Uh, and it's, it's really a phenomenon. And so, you know, if you start, if you look at how they started um, back in 2003, and you have to put yourself in the context there. China, you know, is very much of an emerging economy, not so much trust going on in the economy. So the first thing they did is that they created this two-way review system, a bit like Amazon. But Amazon came on top of an economy that was already functioning. Um, Taobao did that, uh, did kind of a leapfrog type of jump into an economy where all of a sudden people could trust each other. So they created trust, and then the second thing that they did, you know, they realized there wasn't so much of a developed infrastructure in China to do business. So, you know, when you're in China, you just basically build the infrastructure them, uh, yourself. Uh, and so they did that by bringing together logistics providers, booming industry, it's become a booming industry in China, uh, in part thanks to Taobao. Uh, and then they created also a new payment system, kind of a like a PayPal uh, equivalent it's called Alipay uh, through a consortium of 70 banks in China, they were able to do that. And so this, I think, are the two key elements that 
you know, would not uh, have allowed Taobao to be in business. They would not have been able to create value in the first place if they hadn't brought, to, uh, brought about trust, uh, recipe for trust, and the whole uh, missing infrastructure. So from there, they were able to create a double value proposition. First, a large choice of um, you know, any types of good at the best price quality ratio for all the Chinese consumers out there. And then you know, giving access to anyone who had something to sell to basically a large market, large pool of consumers. Channels with Taobao, um, you know, there's obviously cost involved in building the IT and the infrastructure. Uh, and no revenue stream to start with because you know this was uh, subsidized to uh, by by Alibaba by the parent company uh, and essentially to start building the business this is what you see a lot in startups nowadays um, and it also helped to drive eBay out of China uh, which was the leader leader before uh, before Taobao came in so this is phase one this is 2003 and so now I want to take you to 2006 uh, I invite you to see what goes on in 2006. All of these people that had something to sell, basically they realized that they had an opportunity to become micro-entrepreneurs. And so Taobao realized that, and they, uh, they changed their uh, kind of key activities. They started focusing on these people to help them grow their business. They changed the value proposition into a much more of a professional one. And uh, they, uh, at that point, also brought, and this is another part of the ecosystem, they brought new plays into this ecosystem. So uh, app developers, even fashion models that can pose with your product for marketing. A lot of them just live on Taobao. They just make a living on Taobao. They don't have to do anything else. Uh, so it's a huge, uh, huge economy. And so they understood how to do that very well. Uh, they started also to develop a different kind of customer relationship. Uh, you know, they created the Taobao University to train and empower all of these uh, micro entrepreneurs. And in the process, started to make their first uh, revenue, revenue streams out of that through ads and through the sale of advanced features. So we have now a budding ecosystem that uh, you know, is very successful. And I want to show you one more move that Taobao did. Uh, this is in 2008. Uh, and they started realizing that with this very popular platform, they had developed a new key asset. Basically, hundreds of millions of Chinese consumers in their database. And once you have that, you can start creating a new type of value proposition to give basically access to hundreds of millions of consumers this time to all the big brands out there, the uh, uh, international and Chinese brands that are uh, thinking about establishing themselves in China. This, uh, this is one part of Taobao, it's called Timon. Um, and again, obviously the customer relationship changes with this. And with that, for the first time, they uh, started to charge a commission on, um, or a membership fee and a commission on the, on the business. So the last thing I want to say here is that, and this is my point, I think Taobao and the leaders of Taobao understood very well that one of the key things they had to do well was to start to understand how to manage this, this overall ecosystem. So build it in the first place and then manage the uh, policies that allow this whole ecosystem to work very well. And you see that in a lot of these peer-to-peer uh, -peer platforms nowadays as well. And if you hear Jack Ma, uh, you know, he says, you know, we're not so much looking for the ne next tech developers to hire the next tech developers or, you know, marketing uh, whiz kids. That's important too. But what, we, what we're really interested in is to, uh, you know, get the people like a sociologist and psychologist who can understand how to create the policies um, and the incentives so that the ecosystem works well. So the, 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 uh, the role of the CEO here and the management team is almost is actually a lot closer to that of a of a mayor of a city, right? So they need to set prices, they build the infrastructure. They even had to manage demonstrations at some point uh, because of uh, of the kind of uh, price uh, policies they had. So 
I think this is what we can learn from Taobao. Uh, obviously, huge success in uh, in China. Uh, we don't know that very well, but you know it's estimated that they created that they are, uh, created uh, 18 million jobs. Uh, you know, five million directly on the platform through micro entrepreneurs quitting their jobs and becoming self-employed, um, and uh, and then 13 other million uh, indirectly through the value chain, etc. There is more trust in the economy and the community. Lots of stories. I won't go too much into that, but uh, really interesting stories of how people start to trust in each other a lot more than before. And then it's also giving, uh, uh, you know, a marketplace for um, for villages, for rural areas, for remote regions to participate in the economy. Uh, you know that China is seeing a huge boom of uh, urbanization and. Part of uh, this, these e-commerce platforms, and Taobao being one of the main ones, uh, is allowing to, uh, to give opportunities to people uh, to in, in the regions without having to move. And then finally, uh, I think, you know, if you look at the state of the digital economy in China, it's actually a lot more advanced, I think, than what we can see in Europe and America. Uh, and they're now looking, you know, they're ushering this new future into the, what they call the C2B economy. So it's uh, uh, where you have consumers coming onto the platform saying, you know, I need that kind of product uh, with that kind of uh, features and that kind of design, etc. And then the, uh, a provider on the platform raises their hand and says, yeah, okay, I'm, we can build that for you. It's available at this price. Uh, I can ship it to you in so many days and so on and so forth. So reversing the, uh, the relationship almost. So that's the first story. And so I think the lesson here is that you can, you know, create, if you look at how you can create or reorganize the ecosystem, then you can often unlock value or find a way that the market uh, can work all of a sudden. There's a lot of cases where, you know, you can just see a, a block on the road Maybe there's no payer, people don't have access, they don't have enough skills, maybe they don't understand. So if you think a little bit upstream, uh, organizing the ecosystem, creating a new value chain around that uh, often is a, is a very powerful key for creating a new, uh, a new market. So that is story number one. Uh, I want to move to Europe, as I said before, um, with this B2B company uh, and, and look at how they basically have been fighting climate change at the same time as unlocking new value for their, for their customers and making them happier. The theme here that I think we can all copy and get inspiration from is uh, servitization and performance. The company I want to talk about is Michelin, the tire company. Uh, I think most of us know it as well. So they started with a pretty... A standard business model, Michelin. You know, they were selling high-quality tires uh, to a customer segment made of. Uh, this time here, we're focusing on the uh, the haulage companies, the CEOs of haulage companies, and they were basically selling tires. They a small to start with. This business model had some uh, some uh, challenges. One thing was they were starting to see all of these low-cost players come from South Korea, China, and so on and so forth, that were starting to uh, eat up their margins. Um, the other thing is that they knew they had a superior technology in their tires, but they had struggled up until then to figure out how to monetize that value. And then the last thing they saw is that in Europe, you know, they were writing was kind of on the wall about um, you know, new regulation uh, in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of sustainability. And so they, they didn't want to become a victim of that. Uh, and so they wanted to anticipate that, to lead that. So that's kind of their context, the way they started. So the first thing they did is they started to see if they could understand their customer better. And so, you know, the first thing they said was, well, what we know is that this customer needs to buy tires. But actually, spending a lot more time with them, they understood that this customer had a whole other host of jobs. For those of you who are familiar with the value proposition canvas, here we're talking about the jobs that people have to do, all of these tasks, these objectives that they need to achieve. 
And so in this case, Mr. Best here, this is the character from, uh, from Michelin. Uh, and, you know, he had all of these things and it started to become extremely heavy for, for this kind of uh, customer. So with this insight, they went back to the business model. They went back to the drawing board and they said, hey, what if we create a new value proposition that takes, into, takes responsibility for all of these tasks, not just selling the best tire, but taking um, you know, responsibility for helping this customer manage their budget, uh, you know, dispose the tires, uh, inspect that the, tire, the tires are in good shape, and so on and so forth. So tire peace of mind, basically. And so with that, they changed their customer relationship into something that was very transactional before, um, which now became a long-term contract uh, based on kilometers that the trucks were driving. And they knew how many uh, kilometers every truck was driving because, you know, with telematics, uh, chips in the tires and so on, uh, they were able to, to have that kind of information. And so then they started also to change the, the way they would charge. So it wasn't just uh, selling tires. It was uh, uh, asking people to pay a monthly cost based on the kilometer, based on the contract, something that was agreed upon before. Uh, and you see here that it's very nice for Michelin, obviously, predictable revenue. It's also very nice for the customer, predictable costs, right? And if you go on the Michelin website, they tell you, you know, how much you can save a year if you do that. Uh, so it becomes uh, very appealing for the, for the customer. So, you know, they charged, they understood that uh, the uh, customer had a new, a uh, lot more complex set of jobs to meet. They charged per kilometer, not tires. They also, you know, solved the conflict of interest because now they weren't trying to sell as, as many tires as possible to the customer. They had aligned their interest with trying to optimize the, the, the tires because Michelin actually took the responsibility to dispose of the tires and replace them for free. So a big conflict of interest solved here. And surprise, they didn't expect that, but they saw that in doing that, they were able to establish a deeper relationship and deeper brand loyalty from their customer uh, to, with, with Michelin. So based on that, uh, they went one more time, they went one, one, uh, one bit further, and they realized that if there was even one objective higher than all of this, it was to increase profitability for these customers. So they did one more change to their business model, one more value proposition, which is actually promising an increase of profitability. Uh, and with that, again, tweak to the customer relationship. Uh, it's now a four-year contract with a guarantee of outcome and a guarantee of uh, returning the money if the outcomes are not met. Uh, so, and then they get paid on results. Uh, they get paid on the performance that they're able to, to deliver. Obviously, with all this, I haven't talked much about this, but once you change the front end of the business model, everything that the customer can see, you also need to start changing the back end of the business model. So they had new activities, uh, new resources, a whole set of fleet management tools that Michelin customers were able to use to monitor this whole system. A lot of uh, care in selecting the key partners a lot of time to actually tweak which partner they would uh, get into to provide this whole system um, and obviously a different type of cost structure which i've just summarized here with uh, fleet management so very inspiring i think business model if you look at the results uh, just for the customer you know uh, less uh, liters spent per kilometer per 100 kilometers uh, it's the equivalent of 3,000 euros less per truck for the customer, so less costs, plus 2% in profit margin. You have to imagine that these uh, you know, customers, typically they are between 0 and 2% to start with, so it's a huge incre increase in their profit margin and uh, less emissions uh, you know, into, into the air, which is obviously good for the environment it's also good for the customer uh, and for michelin because at that time as i mentioned before they were you know the government was talking about uh, putting a tax on emission and so this this also addressed the problem so here's what we can learn i think about michelin here 
you know, you find the jobs behind the product, right? Often we're stuck in, you know, here's a product we have, we've been selling this, so we're going to keep selling this same product. No, you know, let's stop and look at actually the jobs, the needs behind the product. Uh, let's figure out what it is. Maybe we can also discover new jobs. And then let's see if we can, instead of just pushing a product, let's see if we can create a service or a, um, a promise of performance that, that does, you know, at least as good of a job as uh, the product or even better as is in the case of, uh, as is the case of, uh, of Michelin. So that is the second story. And the last story I want to share with you is a bit more experimental. So it's, you know, the story of a pop philosopher meeting a Silicon Valley CEO. Uh, and here I want to talk about this whole idea of embracing higher order needs. And I'll get to that in a second. The company I want to talk about is Airbnb. And I think we all know, you know, and to some extent we've heard too much of Airbnb, you know, the business model, the way they work, their growth, etc. When I discovered the story, I, was, I thought, oh, there's another angle to how they're looking uh, at the future right now, which I think is really interesting. So I want to pull here the, uh, the customer profile of a, of a typical traveler. And you know, when I think about this myself or when I do this exercise in a workshop, often people come up with very kind of, uh, you know, standard, let's say, jobs, pains, and gains, right? It's things like, you know, I need to organize myself for traveling. I need to find a, uh, a room to stay, um, you know, get work down on the road, and so on and so forth, right? Then the kind of pains that you see, well, you know what, it's too expensive. Maybe I end up in a tourist trap. Uh, you know, I lose my luggage, my flight is canceled, and so on and so forth. And the kind of gains, uh, you know, maybe you want to be, have the whole process be really extremely easy. Uh, maybe you want tips on what to visit on your, on your trip. You want to have a great breakfast and so on and so forth. And in many ways, um, you know, Airbnb does that very well. But they started, you know, the company focused on learning. They started to look at the experience of their, of their customers. And so they realized after studying and following customers uh, for quite a long time, that 75% of people, customers or travelers, are dissatisfied with their journey. And so this may have nothing to do with Airbnb itself. You know, in many ways, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's very convenient, clean, you know, often lower you know, price than a hotel. People are happy with these things. But in general, they're dissatisfied with their journey. And so there may be a more fundamental reason behind this. And this is where the philosopher comes in. Some of you may recognize Alain de Botton. He's, uh, he's an author. He's also the founder of the School of Life um, based in London. And so here's what he says about the state of, of capitalism, also a state of business today. He says, you know, people don't like capitalism because it does not deliver on the ultimate promise of deeper satisfaction. He uses a, a Greek term called eudaimonia, uh, which means deeper satisfaction. So he thinks, you know, we're, we're a little bit tired of this. Uh, and, you know, he shows us that advertisers actually do a great job at understanding these, these, you know, this deeper satisfaction that we're after. So I'll use two examples that he mentions here. You know, Liquor Company, uh, in this case, Smirnoff here, you know, promises, promising great moments of, uh, um, you know, uh, being among friends and having a good time, etc. You use another example, Patek Philippe, watch company, you know, talking about uh, the whole joy of passing values onto the next generation, etc. But what he says is that, you know what, these are great values. This is exactly what we're looking for. But the products behind, you know, the bottle of liquor and the watch, they actually are not helping us to get those uh, the, that deeper satisfaction, right? They don't deliver on these promises. So, you know, here he, he, he introduces to us, you know, the, uh, the fact that if, if, you know, you're familiar with the Maslow Pyramid of Needs, the fact that a lot of the economic activity 
of the products that are available is still focused on the lower end of the pyramid physiological safety belonging you know everything that has to do with convenience lower price uh getting faster cheaper and so on and so forth what is this? the future 21st century which is what we're uh you know interested in today there will be a shift there is an opportunity to satisfy those needs right and so you know airbnb if you look at their advertising is a bit in the same predicament right they have great advertising they talk about belonging everywhere that's what their logo represents too but yet travelers are quite dissatisfied as we've seen before and so uh Alain de Botton was actually invited to work with uh with airbnb and they have a whole uh, uh collaboration you can read about it they even uh, uh published a, a book together a uh, new version of a book of Alain de Botton about travel um and this is what he says about travelers right so tra or travel agencies like airbnb so travel agents would be wiser to ask us what we hope to change about our lives rather than simply where we wish to go. So that was the insight uh, that you know, the philosopher kind of brought to, uh, to the CEO. And at the same time, it really matched much the view that uh, Brian Chesky here, the CEO of Airbnb, had about the business. So I'm not in the business of selling room. I'm in the business of uh, happy traveling. So they started to look at you know what they could do uh with 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 that kind of new insight and if you go back to our customer profile here uh they actually identified three things that they said you know what we can create new value here the first need the first higher order need was you know what people when they travel they want to connect with another culture and they don't want to do that by you know hitting every museum in town but actually through having a meaningful relationship with local people. Right? Second thing was, want to improve relationships. So a lot of people actually hope, that's what they discovered, that going away with their loved one will get them to deepen their connection with them. And again, you know, the Botton says, you know, it's not just by having a nice candle in the room or maybe being you know, in a place with, that has a nice view, maybe it can help, but that doesn't go to the fundamentals of what you're, what you're really trying to get done. And the third thing that they identified was that you know we take we often take uh, traveling with the hope of kind of taking a break from everything and enabling us to think about our future, gain clarity about our future, what we were, what our work is about, our dreams, how we live our life, and so on and so forth. So. As mentioned, now this is experimental. We don't. There's no business model behind this. We don't know how all this translates into into a business yet for Airbnb. Um, but for me, when you start asking that question, you start imagining all sorts of new possibilities. And I think this is the value of this uh, uh, of you know this story. Um, and so, if you go back to our pyramid of needs here, you can see that if you get stuck at the low end of the pyramid. Uh, you know, you're going to keep imagining how to make the platform more convenient, cheaper, you know, uh, services uh, that go in that direction and so on and so forth. But if you start plugging in those uh, needs like stepping back sort of our future, improving our relationship and connecting uh, with another culture, then it opens up, uh, you know, uh, it opens up for all sorts of new possibilities. And so I think what we have to do, and I think this is what we can learn from Airbnb here, uh, thinking about the higher order jobs, the higher order needs of our customers is interesting to imagine new, uh, new ways of creating value um, and uh, basically helping them to, through you know, new value proposition, helping your customers achieve them, helping them almost climb that uh, hierarchy of needs, uh, I think is, is what... Uh, uh, what you know, we can all think about in our respective, uh, respecting businesses. So I want to summarize quickly the, the three stories uh, in a way that you know, hopefully make them uh, translatable in your, in your own sector. So we first look at Taobao. Taobao had an approach of 
building the missing infrastructure, developing the ecosystem. Uh, this allowed them to create a new value proposition. And then they realized that you know, one big job for the management of the company was to actually manage that ecosystem. So that was the first story. The second story was with Michelin. Michelin uh, looked at changing their value proposition by serving the function behind the product, not just selling the product. Uh, going to customers with a long, longer term relationship and uh, charging for performance ultimately for kilometers first then for performance and then airbnb you know thought of looked at their customers not just in the standard way but starting to uncover these higher order needs um, and working to now you know uh, helping their customers climb uh, climb the pyramid in, uh, in, uh, through new value proposition and ultimately a new business model. So this is a little bit the vision, I think, the interest we have with these uh, stories, 21st century business models, as we call them. Now, we've talked about three themes today, new ecosystems and value chains, servitization and performance, and high order needs. I think there's many other themes like that that we could talk about. You know, three that come to mind is how do you build communities in interesting ways? Uh, the whole theme of circular economy, which is certainly becoming very big in Europe. Uh, and the whole idea of you know, behavior change, helping people uh, uh, change, helping companies uh, change, I think is very big. There's a lot more you could imagine. Um, that's, uh, that's just a, a starting list, which, uh, which we, find, uh, we find interesting. So, that's, I think, what I had to share. And uh, I think, uh, Kavi, over uh, to you. And let's see if we can have a bit of a conversation, see if there's any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Um, just a reminder to everyone who's in the session right now, we will be providing a recording of the webinar. We won't be providing the slides, but we will be providing a recording. If you had a technical glitch and you had to drop out and come back in again, um, you'll be able to catch up on any of the parts that you missed. So Greg, I have a couple of questions here that have come through. Um, we might not have enough time to get through all of them, but let's take a few. Um, one of the first is a pretty broad question for you, but what is the difference between strategy and business model for you? Okay, good question. Um... So I think your business model is your uh, your strategic roadmap. Is is um, you know strategy broadly is uh, uh, where and how uh, where you're going to play in your in which particular market with which customers with which assets um, uh, and and how you're going to do that. Uh, and I think if you look at your business model, it basically translates that aspiration into a map. Uh, in order for you to be able to do that. So I think the business model, especially if you use the business model canvas, becomes the way to, uh, um, you know, to op operationalize your strategy, uh, I would say. Awesome. Let's jump into um, something that came out of your Michelin case. When you talked about Michelin evolving their models, did, did, did you think they knew it would work, build it and sell it? Um, or do you think they work with one or two pilot customers to run some tests or were there other approaches? Do you think it was a bit of a shot in the dark? Yeah, so what I know about it is that it actually took them 10 years to get the, prof the, the model to, uh, uh, profitable. So they tweaked a lot the partners that they uh, you know, were working with, you know, trying something with one partner, realizing it doesn't work, starting with a new one. Uh, you know, talking to customers a lot, observing customers, spending a lot of time with them. So definitely not a big plan where, you know, we, we design the strategy in a workshop room and then go out and implement it. Uh, it had to be a trial and error process. I don't know if they, you know, um, went in very consciously into that trial and error process. Um, I think this, this is, uh, you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago now uh, when they started. So uh, I'm assuming that they learned a lot on the way and if they had to start again, uh, could do it a lot more uh, systematically, this whole idea of, uh, of trial and error. Um, from what you understand when you studied that, that, um, that case, do you think 
how, how do you think the, the shift of Michelin was perceived from a tire provider to a fleet manager? By the customer? So, I mean, I think from every angle, it's, uh, you know, it's a success story. And, uh, and uh, you know, for obviously from the point of view of Michelin, being able to differentiate themselves from the point of view of the regulator, uh, seeing that, uh, you know, there's innovation in industries from, um, and, and obviously from the point of view of, of uh, customers, because ultimately the, the business uh, is successful. I think customers starting to understand. And again, if you go on the, the website of Michelin, it, it's interesting to communicate, you, you know, your costs are typically this. If you work with us, you know, you, you pay us that much, but then you're going to have a saving of X amount of uh, thousands of euros. Uh, and, and I think they've developed a formula that becomes extremely attractive uh, for customers. And you see it with the brand loyalty um, that, that customers, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of embrace with Michelin. Now they're very happy. They don't need to think about the, uh, all of these sort of paints that come along with, uh, with the tire um, post and they can focus on, the, uh, on their main business. So I think it's kind of a win-win-win strategy here, win-win-win formula uh, that, uh, that they were able to, uh, to create. And well, what's interesting is one of the comments that came through during the session is, you know, how do you, how do you sell to management the idea of selling fewer tires to change the model? Um, which leads to another question, you know, is it important for companies to sometimes compromise on the um, goal by first understanding the customer experience? Yeah, so I think more than compromising is being open to seeing how you can create more value, ultimately also capture more value for your business in the long run. Um, you know, my experience working with lots of different companies is that it's, it's hard enough to create a new, to create a startup, right? If you're an entrepreneur, you know this, it's very difficult figuring out what customers want and so on. It's difficult, but what I see with large companies especially, is that the biggest resistance comes from inside, uh, right? Because you're starting to figure out a new way of approaching thing, of changing a market. And at the same time, you have this big legacy organization that realizes that, you know, this is going to put everything upside down. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of resistance by the big organization, uh, you know, towards, towards the startup effort. So if you're a CEO, you know, more than comp compromising, I think the, the, um, the more positive way of looking at this is, is starting to see how you can, uh, you know, craft some experiments and play with that and monitor these experiments uh, as, as something that could become uh, something interesting for the future. Do you think good ideas and businesses can get lost because um, companies give up too early before really finding the business model that actually works? Yes, I think so, definitely. Um, same kind of, you know, uh, I guess comment as just for the question before. There's, um, you know, large companies are not uh, designed to uh, nurture, you know, ideas. So. Uh, bad, bad and good ideas, but how to nurture good ideas, it, it takes a different approach than running the business. Right? We talk a lot about, um, you know, with the strategy, strategize the community, about these two sides of what you should be good at if you're a big company. One side is, uh, you know, is about exploiting the business. You know, you have a running business. You need to uh, do a good job at that. You don't want to undermine it. But at the same time, you need to have one side of the organization focusing on exploring the future. And so playing these two games in parallel with a different set of rules, different people, uh, and figuring out the connections between the two, I think is an art that um, you know, companies are, 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 trying to, are trying to do. And I think that's the right thing moving forward. Here's an interesting one regarding um, your comments on the circular economy. Do you see any challenges for companies in using the business model canvas for transitioning to a circular economy? Mm, I think the, uh, so what the business model canvas is very good at is to show you the, or is to map the strategy of your, of your business. If you, um, and, and, you know, 
you don't want too complex a canvas uh, to do to try and do all of these different uh, things. So what I think would work well, and maybe it's been doing another uh, post or webinar, is to look at how you can use the business model canvas in conjunction with some other frameworks that have been developed into uh, for uh, for the uh, the circular economy, you know, uh, life cycle flows and things like that. What I think will be interesting is how you can translate this kind of uh, view of the environment, this uh, and, and societal view uh, as well, into uh, your strategy within the organization. That that connection here. Uh, I think is is what makes the circular economy work for a business, um, and uh, and yeah, I think that's something maybe we can explore uh, visually for for one of the next ones. On the session, and just wanted to remind uh, audiences that the exclusive offer to webinar attendees is on the screen at the moment. Um, if you're listening in. Uh, in the next 48 hours, you can get 15% off our master's bundle, which is both the Mastering Business Models and Mastering Value Proposition Design courses. Simply go to strategizer.com slash training slash courses. And when you make the purchase of the master's bundle, type in SEPT Web Webinar 2017 as the coupon code. I will be sending this out in the email that goes um, that will come out to you in the next 24 hours um, in order to claim your, your coupon. Um, but to also get the replay. So Greg, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thanks so much for everybody who came in. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, um, but maybe Greg, that could be uh, potential for future blog posts. Uh, thanks, and thanks everyone. Awesome. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.